Okay, it's a tremendous pleasure and honor actually to have been asked to at least briefly introduce Mary Lou Pardue to you. I'll, I'll keep this very short because this time is, uh, is for her. But I sort of, my comments in, in essence are uh, that Mary Lou Pardue is a brilliant scientist, one of the best we have at MIT. She's just a passionate and committed teacher and a hands-on teacher in a way that very few senior faculty can be around here. She's had a tremendous, um, put a tremendous effort into service and uh, at all levels, international, national, and around the university. And she's a wonderful person. And I'm just going to make a very quick comment. <laughs> Mary Lou, I met her in 76 when I started here. But I, she came in to MIT in 1972. And you'll be hearing the earlier parts of her career, I think, uh, during the, the next hour. Um, when I first met her, Mary Lou was especially noted for her work on heat shock. Uh, in Drosophila, and that was the beginning of our growing recognition that organisms actually have very complex responses to heat, to all sorts of stresses. It spawned the um, the chap molecular chaperone field grew out of that that whole body of of work, as did our understanding of how the complexities of cellular responses, and it's evolved now to this incredibly elegant work on how linear chromosomes, other ways of maintaining linear, the ends of linear uh, chromosomes. Um, Mary Lou's uh, been a tremendous inspiration and model for me because she's been a terrific teacher, and she's run, always run a small lab and has continued to do experiments herself, which sets her apart from the majority of the senior faculty here. If I ever go in to look, meet Mary, try to look for Mary Lou in her office, uh, most of the time she'll be peering down a microscope. It's not instead of on the phone, so that really sets her apart. And she's been just a superb teacher of uh, project labs. Her evaluations are just remarkable, and the students write amazing things about how she's touched their lives. Mary Lou, as I said, carried a huge burden of, of uh, service. She was, uh, one, when she joined the department, there were only two women here, I guess Lisa, who was the first to join, and Anna Maria was here. And I think that led to a disproportionate number of committee assignments and requests to do stuff, which she's done with great grace. I talked to Tanya briefly about Mary Lou the other day, and she said how wise she was. Many people have come to her for counsel on all sorts of things. I certainly have. And um, Tanya was saying it on committees and things like that, Mary Lou was regarded for her very qu quiet and wise way of being able to build consensus and bring things together. Um, just before you saying something, closing something personally, I just sort of note, too, that um, I guess Hillary Clinton says there are um, 18 million grass, glass cracks in the glass ceiling for president. I think when I, I got here, there weren't many cracks in the ceiling. There was a rather narrow slot with a very small number of women in this uh, department and in prominent positions in science. And it's political and social pressures and that sort of thing are needed to get rid of these um, glass ceilings. But I think the other component, which is critical is the emergence of just outstanding individuals who are just so remarkable. People sort of tend to forget gender, race, whatever other boundary condition they had. And I think Mary Lou, in many ways, <laughs> has uh, been a real leadership in helping to change uh, the status of women in science by just being who she is and so immensely respected. We have 65 to 70 percent women in our, in our undergrad population. We have wonderful female faculty colleagues now, and I think you've been a major force in that. I'll just close finally by saying I've, Mary Lou's been a wonderful colleague and a close friend since I got here. I remember her, my first meeting with the grad students where the grad students were coming up to me and saying, you know, what did you do your, <laughs> your undergrad? And, um, they kept mistaking me for a grad student. So, after about three or four of this, and I was delicately trying to 
figure out how to do this, Mary Lou stationed herself by my side, and every time someone would come up, she would introduce the new faculty member. She <laughs> had that art of taking care of, of people, and me in particular, for quite a while. And one of the nice things about moving to this building, she's now my neighbor, and uh, when Mary Lou's on the floor, one of the great things is you see her coming down the hall, and her face lights up in this smile that just lights up the whole hallway, and I'm glad you can come and <laughs> see, uh, share some time with Mary Lou. <laughs> Turn green. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I was born in Kentucky. Lived most of, did most of my growing up there. My father was an academic, and my father, my father was an academic. So we were away for a sabbatical at Caltech and a couple of years of academic research leave at Chicago and Oak Ridge. But most of the time, I was living in Lexington, as you can maybe tell by my accent. Uh, and uh, I went to very good schools, liked everything I took except biology, which was strange because I liked biology a lot, but I was pretty bored with the class. Uh, I went to college at William & Mary where I enjoyed the liberal arts and majored in biology. And when I finished, the faculty was determined to send me to graduate school, gave me lots of applications for places, I put them in, got most of them, got some good fellowships, but I didn't want to go. They were fallbacks. What I really wanted to do, I had, first of all, I might say I hadn't seen a woman with a PhD and a job I wanted, so I didn't see any reason to go to graduate school. Secondly, I was ready for adventure. And thirdly, I wanted to go to Oak Ridge National Lab, which I knew about from my father. And I should say something about that before I go any further, because. At that time, it was really a really remarkable place. Uh, it was a congruence of several things. First of all, there was money and political will because the Atomic Energy Commission was wanting to spend money to turn these new facilities into something for, useful for the world. It was appealing to the scientists because you could do radiation biology. And you've got to forget about kits. You've got to forget about clones. You've got to forget about restriction enzymes. We're going way back. And so one of the few things you could do to manipulate biological material was radiation. So it was very attractive to a lot of good scientists. And the third thing about Oak Ridge was that they got a really remarkable guy for a director. The guy was Alexander Hollander. And he was quite a guy. Uh, <laughs> He was, in the first place, had a very respected radiation biologist. But other than that, he was very good at getting money out of the AEC. He was very good at identifying young scientists and convincing them to go there. And he was very good at doing all sorts of things. One of my favorite stories about him is how he founded the National Drosophila Meetings, with or without meaning to, and I'm not sure which. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the story was that Bill Baker, who had been at Oak Ridge, had taken a job on the faculty at Chicago, and he invited Dan Lindsley from Oak Ridge to come give a seminar. So Dan went up, and he and Bill were having such fun talking about Drosophila that they decided they needed to go up to Wisconsin, where Larry Sander was, and talk to him. So they spent a couple of days up in Madison, and Dan got back to Oak Ridge two days late. And Hollander had a way of coming around and checking up on you. So he came around to see why Dan was two days late. And Dan couldn't resist telling him he'd been at the National Drosophila meeting. <laughs> and the next thing, I don't know whether Hollander did this because he was so impressed with that or whether he did it to call Dan's bluff. But anyway, he wrote a little article in the Oak Ridge paper that they sent out to universities around the country. And said that Dan had been to the National Drosophila meeting. And Dan immediately started getting calls and letters from people who said, why wasn't I invited? <laughs> <laughs> so the next year, Dan felt obliged to start the National Drosophila meeting. 
And lo and behold, it has existed to this day. Thousands of people go at beach every year, and I think it's probably the model for the other single organism meetings. I don't know of any that started before that one. So that was the kind of guy Alex was, and to this day, as I say, you're not sure why he did it, but whyever he did it, I think it was a good thing, because those meetings are really good. So anyway, I went down to Oak Ridge and got a job. And when I got there, the, the job was one of the big labs that worked on cancer. And the, the head, head of the lab, in fact, later became head of the NCI. But when I got there, they said, well, the woman you're supposed to replace is not going to leave because her husband flunked the physical for his draft. So we're giving you to this young guy who's just started. And fortunately, I didn't make a fuss. The young guy was Jack von Borstel. He was a uh, hyperbacon and Drosophila geneticist. He had just arrived, and it took me about two days to realize, boy, was I lucky, because it was a wonderful research experience. We were doing basic stuff. Had I been part of the other big lab, I would have been doing much more applied stuff and wouldn't have had quite the interaction with all the other young scientists that I did. So I had a wonderful time, and I learned a lot about radiation biology. We were working on lethal genes and nucleolus. And then for a while, I worked for Dan Lindsley. And eventually, when I decided to go back to graduate school, I had two people in mind that I thought I'd work with. One was Seymour Benzer, who was doing really elegant stuff with genes, molecular biology, and prokaryotes. And the other was Joe Gall, who was doing equally remarkable stuff with chromosomes in eukaryotes. And after thinking about it for a while, I decided I'd go work for one of them for a couple of years and see whether I liked that or whether I wanted to work with the other one. And I decided I'd go work. Seymour Benzer was at Purdue University, and Joe Gall was at Minnesota. I'm not sure how much not wanting to endure the Minnesota winters <laughs> influences. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I decided to go work with Joe, with Seymour because I thought I'd learn more with him than I would learn that I could take to Joe's lab than vice versa. So I went to Seymour's lab. By the time I got there, Seymour had decided prokaryotes were not what he was going to work on anymore. He was going to work on the brain. And so he was spending his time in his office reading textbooks on biology and the like. His office and his labs were on the top floor. He had a couple of postdocs in the basement. And I was given to one of the postdocs working on ribosomal proteins. So I learned to do acrylamide gels. I put together an amino acid analyzer. <laughs> uh, did that, did peptide columns and things like that. And we kept coming out with what we thought were too many proteins. Because the hypothesis was it was known that the N-terminal amino acids of the ribosomal proteins, I'm not sure how this was known, were all either methionine or alanine. And the hypothesis was there must be only a few, because after all, think how many amino acids there are. What's the chance? <laughs> so this tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> so anyway, we worked on that until one day Seymour came down and he said, Mary Lou, every time something doesn't work, you tell me you're a Drosophila geneticist. So come teach me about Drosophila. At which point, I happily left <laughs> the ribosomal proteins. And Joe was just looking at flies, worms, planaria, all sorts of things to see what he thought would be a good model system to work on. He had already planned to go do a sabbatical with Sperry at Caltech. Sperry was working on split brains in mammals, and that Joe was going, I mean, Seymour was going to work on that. So he asked me if I would come be a graduate student with him, but I had already decided I was going to Joe Gall, even at Minnesota. And luckily, Joe Gall had moved to Yale. So <laughs> I went to Yale. By this time, I had seen some women with PhDs who had interesting jobs. None of them really had faculty jobs, but they were like senior scientists in somebody else's lab. So I thought that was a viable career path. And I went off to Yale. Just before I got to Yale, some exciting things happened. That was when Marmor and Doty had shown that you could denature and renature nucleic acids. And this suddenly gave you a method 
for comparing different nucleic acids because if you renatured different nucleic acids, the amount of hybridization you got told you something about how similar they were. The only trick was you had to be able to label one of them specifically so you could tell which was which. And that meant that there were not an awful lot of things you could do, but uh, there were a lot of useful things that were done. The best probe, of course, was ribosomal RNA, because you could label that. Labeling all had to be done in vivo in those days. You could label it with radioactivity, and you could purify the ribosomes and get really pure enough RNA that you could say something about it. And Max Bernstein had used this to show that the ribosomal genes were associated with the nucleolus organizer in amphibians. Ritosin Spiegelman had done similar experiments in Drosophila. So it was kind of opening up a whole new world. It was really exciting to get there. Yale did the same sort of a graduate program that we've done here for, we used to do here for years, which was the first year all the students spent taking courses, no rotations, and then at the end of the first year, you negotiated for the lab you were going to be in. And I did get into Joe's lab. It never occurred to me that I wouldn't. And <laughs> <laughs> looking now at people who don't get where they want to go, I think, well. So I got into Joe's lab. I arrived there late in the spring, and Joe's way of doing things was to give you some sort of a little experiment to do and figure that you should, by being around the lab, come up with your own <coughs> thesis project. So what he had was two big Erlenmeyers of DNA, one from an axolotl. These are amphibians with enormous genomes. One from a wild-type axolotl and one from an axolotl with a small nucleolus. And the thought was that I would do the hybridization and show that the small nucleolus had fewer ribosomal genes. And he also had learned from Don Brown. You'll hear a lot about Don Brown, who was at Carnegie then. He learned from Don Brown that you could make ribosomal RNA from mouse cells and get it to cross-hybridize nicely with amphibians. And this was really important because the mouse cells grew in defined medium. And so you could easily make screaming hot radioactive probe by dumping nucleotides in with them. So I got there in time. I made some screaming hot ribosomal RNA. And then I went off to Woods Hole for the Woods Hole physiology course, which took half the summer. And then I went off to Hawaii to do some consulting for NASA from my previous life. And when I, <laughs> when I got back in September, I found that some really exciting things had happened. It, it was suddenly discovered that amphibian oocyte nuclei had extra amplified ribosomal genes. This was something that had been, it was a big deal, actually, because one of the important things about DNA being the genetic material was that it's been shown for DNA by Messelson and Stahl and for chromosomes by Herbert Taylor. DNA was always replicated semi-conservatively, and you expected it to be the haploid complement to stay the same as it should. So this was a big deal. What had happened was about 20 years before, a uh, painter had seen Feuillgenstein blobs in the amphibian nucleus not associated with the chromosomes. And everybody had wondered then, is it real? But there was no way to test it. All you could say was Feuillgenstein's DNA, not RNA. But you don't know what else, it, that it doesn't stain something else. And there was absolutely no way of testing whether this was really DNA, except the Feuillgen. So that summer, Jim Keyser had given a talk about one of the most quoted unpublished papers I've ever seen, given a talk which suggested that there was, that DNA was able to affect these nucleoli. So it immediately occurred to everybody that you could now test it. Because if it was true, you should be able to hybridize ribosomal RNA and get more hybrid to the oocytes than to others. So by the time I got back, Joe Gall and Don Brown had both shown that there was amplified DNA in these oocytes. And I think a lot of other people tried it, because 
a couple of years later, I talked to a biochemist someplace, and he said, yeah, he'd spent the summer looking for bufo toads, and he'd only caught three, and they were all males. <laughs> and the th funny thing was, Joe Gall had only caught one, and it was a male. But Joe knows, knew that testis in toads have a residual ovary called the bitters organ. And so Joe, Joe had cut out the bitters organ, done the experiment, and proved it was right, and moved on to other things. Uh, so anyway, that was pretty exciting when I got back. It was exciting, opened up a lot of questions. One that I was particularly interested in was, how did this DNA get out of the chromosome? And what happened to it when it got out? Uh, the, another thing was, of course, that it gave you suddenly a model for being able to get ribosomal genes that you could do something with because you could make enormous amounts of this ribosomal RNA and actually this ribosomal DNA and actually it ran differently in a gradient. So you could actually separate, Max Bernsteel had shown this some time before, that you could actually essentially purify a eukaryotic gene by doing a cesium chloride gradient and taking the very extreme GC-rich part, which was mostly ribosomal. So uh, Joe Gall, of course, realized that these oocytes were important because we could use them as model systems for in-situ hybridization, because here we had an enormous target for the only probe we had, and we could use this to see if we could get the technique to work. We spent a lot of time talking about it. And he said, you know, it's probably not a good thing for somebody to do for a thesis. And I said, yeah, it's not a good thing for somebody to do for a thesis. Mm -hmm. And also, by that time, first of all, I had shown, I had finished looking at the axolotl. And I had shown that there was more DNA in the putative small nucleolus bottle than the other. So we had two conclusions. Either the two bottles had been switched or <laughs> There was something really interesting in the control, and neither one of them could we per persist any further anyway. But I had come up with a really elaborate hypothesis, the, the elaborate plan for figuring out how this DNA came out of the chromosome that I wanted to do. It was one of these things that thesis committees really love. It was really elaborate. Uh, thesis committees love it. No, not the elaborate part, but what they loved was there were two obvious hypotheses, and it would clearly distinguish between A and B. And so they liked it. It was elaborate, but Joe was happy to support me with it. And in fact, about a year later when I told Don Brown about it, he said, we've been trying to do that too, and we haven't been able to think of this way as good as you have. We won't touch it. You can do it uh, later when I told him about the in situ. After saying, this really works, he said, are you still doing the BUDR experiment or can I do it? And so he tried it too. I have to tell you that in the end, none of us solved it because actually neither of the two obvious hypotheses were right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something totally different. Uh, anyway, I, to do that, I had to do a lot of experiments because there were no kits. You had to make your own everything. And I had to figure I wanted to do buoyant density labeling. I had to learn how to make gradients that would separate the right things. And in the meantime, Joe and I were talking about whether or not in situ would work. And we kept worrying that you wouldn't be able to denature the chromosome and get it to stay because the things were so close together. And you have to remember that in those days also, most of the protein was thought to be on the outside of the DNA, so we worried about that. In the end, Joe tried an experiment. It didn't work, and we said, of course, he didn't think it would work. And then pretty soon after that, he went off to a semester sabbatical in England. And it really was a sabbatical because almost as soon as he got there, the British Postal Service went on strike. And when the Postal Service goes on strike, the telephones go on strike, the telegraphs go on strike, the letters go on strike. So we didn't hear from him at all. He told me later uh, that there was this guy there with him who was on sabbatical. And the guy kept going back to see how his lab was. And Joe just couldn't believe that anybody would leave a sabbatical and go back to worry about. The guy was Ned Holt, <laughs> who was a faculty member here. Uh, anyway. 
Joe, we didn't hear from Joe. We were doing fine. I kept working on my various ways of getting ready to do this experiment. One of the things I did learn, actually I learned it before Joe went, was I tried for some reason using the fixative that Joe had used on the in situ that didn't work and found out that that fixative was somehow either cross-linking DNA to the, D, to the protein or keeping the DNA from renaturing anyway. It was causing the DNA to run differently in the gradient, which said that maybe Joe's fixative had not been the right thing. And it turned out when he came back that he had changed the fixative and came back with the first in situ hybridization. So at that point, we changed thesis and I started working on in situ hybridization. And I had several goals. One was to get it to be work better. That was pretty easy. There were a lot of things that I was able to do to get it to work better. Now, remember, we had to do all this detection by autoradiography. And so one of the things about getting it to work better was to get it to take not so long. Although I found a lot of things to do while I was waiting for those experiments to develop. Uh, Another thing I had to do, of course, was to prove it was really in situ hybridization. Remember, I only had one probe. I could do all sorts of biochemistry on the slide. I could uh, compete it with cold ribosomal RNA and showed that it competed with cold and not with other nucleotides. I could do various restriction, not restriction, various enzymatic digestions, which were consistent. But in the end, Everything was only consistent. You could always argue that maybe because this was ribosomal DNA getting ready to be nucleolide, maybe there were proteins there that were specifically binding the RNA. And maybe the RNA wasn't at all hybridizing. It was just sticking to those proteins. What I really wanted was something that would hybridize to the other things on the side and not hybridize to the ribosomal DNA to show that they had been denatured and were capable of binding if I had the right sequence. And it was at that point when Roy Britton published a paper where they were looking with, kinetically with the distribution of highly repeated sequences. And if their data was right, the highly repeated sequences were all over the chromosomes. So I thought maybe I would be able to actually see this. So I made a DNA gradient. I cut out the ribosomal genes. and. That's my favorite experiment because when I developed it, the chromosomes were all covered with grains and the ribosomal DNA at the top wasn't, and that was the thing that I'd really been seeking for. Uh, so the other things I did was I got Don Brown's recipe for making RNA polymerase and learned how to transcribe DNA and RNA so that I could make hotter probes, a lot of things like that. And in the end, I had a real thesis and happily went off looking for a job. Now, when I wrote my thesis, it was <coughs> 1970, and it looked like faculty jobs were kind of hard to come by. And the men in my class were all saying, well, we don't want to leave the country because it might be harder to get a job if we were out of the country. And I knew I wasn't really looking for a job, and I wanted to leave the country, so I wrote down the names of the people I most wanted to work with. And the, Max Bernsteel, Ed Southern, Peter Walker were all in Edinburgh. And the fourth person on the list was in St. Andrews, which is a short trip up. The, so I went off to Edinburgh and had a good time. Uh, I thought I was going to hit the ground running when I got to Edinburgh, <coughs> because when I got to Edinburgh, before I went, I had taken the top of a sucrose gradient, which would have 4 and 5S RNA, and just hybridized it to polyteen chromosomes and found a nice band, which I was sure was 5S RNA. But of course, I couldn't prove it. So I went off to Edinburgh and made some 5S RNA with Bob Williamson, who knew how to make good stuff. And I did the hybridization. I knew it was going to take a month for it to come up, at least if it had been like the other one. So I did the hybrid, and then I had a month to go touring. I had a bunch of seminar invitations. Uh, I spent it tooling around Europe and came back and developed the slides, no grains, horrible morphology, <coughs> terrible experiment, and I couldn't figure out. So I, fortunately, being in Max's lab was good because he had 
amphibian ovaries, and I could go back to my original prep, which I could develop in a day or two instead of spending lots of months tooling around Europe. So I started doing experiments, getting everybody else in the lab was doing cot curves and rot curves. So they were doing hybridization, but in a different sort of way. So I tried their solutions, I tried other solutions, and then I started getting paranoid because, of course, when you do those things, you throw around buckets of ribonuclease. And my probes were all ribonucleotides. So I was keeping people away. I was acid washing. I was getting more and more paranoid. And all of a sudden, one night, I woke up and I thought, maybe the cover slips in Edinburgh are soft glass. And I don't know what made me think this, but the way we did the experiment was to have the preparation on a slide. You put 20 lambdas of hybridization buffer with your RNA on top of that, and then drop a cover slip on it and put it at 65 degrees overnight. And if they were soft glass, they might be leaching alkali. That would explain the horrible morphology. That would explain why I had no RNA. And so I went into the lab. I took a chunk of, of uh, cover slips. I dumped them in hybridization buffer with pH indicator. I put the thing in the oven overnight, and I came back, and it was the most beautiful deep base color you've ever seen. <laughs> I was so happy. So then I dumped them in acid and boiled them for a while and tried an experiment with acid boiled and it worked fine. And the thing that taught me later on was you should talk to people you don't think you should talk to. Because I talked to all the hybridization people and nobody had thought of this. Every time I'd go in and talk to Max about it, he'd say, I'm sure you're going to figure this out. <laughs> and the confidence was nice. But, but a few, a few <coughs> weeks after, a few weeks after that, I was talking to a colleague from Western General who did mammalian tissue culture on cover slips. And I told him what I would found out. And he said, oh, yes. And then you found out you could boil it in acid and it would be fine. All the tissue culture people had done this all along. And I just hadn't thought to ask the right people at the right time. So by that time, Wimber and Stephenson had beat me to the 5S genes in Drosophila. But I got lucky because, uh, first of all, Don Brown had then shown that the 5S RNA genes in amphibians are amplified all the time. You need extra 5S genes to go with the ribosomal RNA genes that they amplified in the oocyte. But they have a whole set that are dedicated, and they're on the telomeres of all the chromosomes. So I was able to localize those. And the next piece of luck came when Eric Weinberg and Larry Kettis arrived. They were working on sea urchin histone and gave me a chance to get hold of my first messenger RNA to hybridize to chromosomes. Because sea urchins are wonderful. Right after they're fertilized, they do nothing but make histone RNA. And that histone RNA, they're willing to label if you just put them in nice solution. They will take up nucleotides. So you can make very hot RNA. Uh, I certainly wasn't going to hybridize them to sea urchin chromosomes. If any of you have ever seen sea urchin chromosomes, you'll know why. They're t 9 But I thought if it's histone, that it would cross-hybridize with Drosophila. So it did, and that was the last thing I got. So now we move to back to looking for a job. And I'll step back in time a little bit to tell you how I came to MIT. Uh, after I'd been in Edinburgh for a few months, Max announced that he was moving to Zurich. He's actually Swiss, and he had been given a professorship at Zurich, which was a big deal. And he offered me a real job to go with him. I was not eager to do that. But I did want to stay in Edinburgh. And I'd been talking to Ed Southern and Peter Walker about things to do anyway. So I went down and asked them if I could move to their lab when Max moved. But at the same time, my real career plan was to be a senior scientist in somebody else's lab. And I had spent a lot of time thinking about which senior scientist I wanted to be in the lab, and Don Brown was the top of the list. So I knew, so I thought I would try to do another postdoc in Don Brown's lab. And I knew Don's lab was hard to get into. I knew people who 
had wanted to get into it and gotten letters saying, you know, I'm full for the next three years, if you can wait. <laughs> and so I wrote to Don and I said, Don, I could come back this year. I'd like to stay in Edinburgh if there'd be a place for me the next year. And pretty soon I got a letter from Don saying, you're out of your head. Uh, I'll be happy to take you either year, but you're foolish not to go for a real job. Apparently he had called Joe Gall and said, why is Mary Lou writing to me for a postdoc? And Joe had told him. So uh, I said, fine, if he's willing to wait two years, I would wait two years and settle back. And the next thing that happened was there was an article in Science about the troubles that women have getting jobs, things like you can't go to a meeting and walk up to some man and say, let's have a drink and I'll tell you about my in-situ hybridization <laughs> and things like that. And then there had been a letter to Science a little bit later, which Don Brown cut out and sent to me. And the letter was from MIT saying that MIT recognized that women had these problems and that they thought the way to do was to look for women. They were looking for women. And Don sent me this and he said, send them your CV. So I sent him my CV because I still wanted to go work for Don and I didn't want to do anything he told me not to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be able to say, I did it. <laughs> so I sent him the CV and that was sometime in the early spring, I guess. And then I got asked to go teach at the Cold Spring Harbor course. Uh, Jim Watson had decided to replace the phage course that had been given for years with a course he called Molecular Cytogenetics. And about six of us were teaching that course for three weeks. And then I started to get letters from places around the country. Oh, Don had already had also sent to send him my CV and he would send it out to people who were looking for jobs, who were looking for <coughs> candidates. So I started getting letters from people asking me to come give seminars. And I was delighted to do that because I love to travel. So I arranged a whole bunch of seminars after the course at Woods Hall at Cold Spring Harbor. And then I ended up at Joe's place for a weekend before I went to give a seminar at Woods Hole and I was going back. And the job seminars turned out to be wonderfully. John, Don Brown offered me a job there and said if I'd come back later, Hopkins was interested in a joint appointment. I had a bunch of other offers. I got back to Joe's house and there was a bunch of telegrams and letters saying, come give a job seminar. And there was a letter from MIT saying, thank you for the application, but we're not interested. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't I, I really was only doing it for Don anyway. I thought I had the job I wanted. And I had a bunch of others that were being to look fun because I had been places where there were actually women professors. Not many, but I'd seen a couple. So anyway, at that point, that was, September, I was going back to Edinburgh and I was coming back at Christmas to interview at Hopkins and I made a bunch of other uh, interview things. And then I was getting phone calls in Edinburgh from places. And one of those phone calls said it was from MIT. And I said, where? And they said they wanted me to come give a job seminar. And I was giving one up at Harvard anyway, so I agreed to stop and do it. Apparently, somebody had called Joe Gall and said, how do we get in touch with Mary Lou? And Joe had said, you better be careful. You've already been in touch with Mary Lou. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I came. And in the end, they offered me a job, which I thought was as sincere an apology as you could get. <laughs> <laughs> I had a wonderful time. I talked to lots of interesting people. Uh, they offered me a job as an associate professor. And they sure offered me a lot more money than Harvard did. <laughs> and also, there were already two women in the department. So not that I felt lonesome without women, but at least I felt that the department was not being leaned on by NIH to hire a woman because they had more women than any place else I had been. So in the end, I came. I'm glad I did. I didn't know I was going to stay as long, but I don't regret a minute of it. We don't regret a minute. <laughs> Do you remember who sent you the letter? Don't ask. <laughs> it's part of the don't ask, don't tell. We'll let you know later. <laughs> So 
So Mary Lou, one of the things I've really admired about you is, you know, you, I'm right across the hall from you, you're always working in the lab. And the question is, how do you manage to do that? You know? <laughs> I grew up in that tradition. Joe Gall always worked in the lab. In fact, I may be one of the, we may be one of the few graduate students who if you came in on the weekend, Joe was not terribly glad for you to be in because he wanted to do his own stuff. Uh, he eventually left Yale and went to Carnegie partly because he had come to the point that he was going to have to be chair of the department and he didn't, he didn't want to do that. Uh, I learned a lot of things that don't work too. For one thing, I learned that Eppendorf tubes dissolve in phenol one time when I was partway through an experiment, left, them in the, left the DNA in the phenol in the Eppendorf tubes that didn't get back till the next day. <laughs> <There was no problem. laughs> so you learn some useful things. And sometimes you find out later that students have done the same thing. <laughs> you, I sort of telomere sh showed up mm -hmm. briefly early and didn't quite get to where heat shock and stress entered in. Maybe you just collect it connect a couple more dots into some of the things that occupied you with your, oh. with your career efforts. Well, one of the things I wanted to do when I came back, one of the things it seemed you could do with in situ hybrid, one of the things you can you turn the sound up? Uh, so one of the things it seemed to me I could do with polyteen chromosomes now remember this, I came back before cloning. Restriction enzymes had just appeared. Uh, cloning was on the horizon. So one of the things that occurred to me I could do with polyteen chromosomes, here you had the whole genome laid out with markers on it. And so I was going to try to do sort of a very primitive chips experiment. I was going to take RNA from different sources and hybridize them and then analyze the RNA by which bands on the polythene chromosomes. And that actually worked and I had a couple of terrific students doing it. But the first thing we wanted, we had to make the RNA, label it in vivo. So Jose Bonner was doing organ culture with imaginal disks and finding different things that were taught predominantly on imaginal disks. And Alan Spradling was doing tissue culture cells. And one of the things we thought we would be able to do with tissue culture cells, we had, you know, the, the normal conditions. But we thought since heat shock puffs were found in all the different tissues that puffed in larvae, we thought they probably were also induced in regular cells. And so we might be able to change the RNA composition by stressing. So we heat shocked and that was really nice because we got only the heat shock puffs and we went on there. It was about the same time that Matt Messelson and Sue Lindquist were doing the same thing. So we were neck to neck, but the papers were complementary rather than conflicting anyway. So it was from that that I got interested in stress. Uh, and we did translational control and all sorts of things like that. Telomeres felt out, fell out of the stress thing because one of the RNAs that we, one of the clones we identified hybridized funny and we started chasing them and were finally forced to convince ourselves that telomeres and Drosophila are made by this special set of transposable elements. Uh, and that has taken off after years of getting the study sections to say, why, has it, why is it not like something else? She can't do this, and the next year saying, well, she did that, but she can't do this. Uh, they now are willing to say, she can do this. <laughs> yeah, You're very active in uh, teaching undergrads. What, what do you like in that? You know, what's your teaching style, and what do you really enjoy about teaching? <clears throat> I really enjoy the small classes where you can really interact with the students. For, for 10 years, Richard Hines and I taught the big development class. And that was fun, although it got, toward the end, it got really difficult to come up with questions that were important that you hadn't asked before. Uh, 
you want the questions that you ask on exams to be something people should remember. And you don't want them to be something they have to be just clever or lucky to get the answers to. And after about 10 years, with everything being in books in the fraternity houses, we sort of ran out of questions. <laughs> For a while, actually, it wasn't so bad because the field was changing enough that the answers changed. <laughs> After the answers stopped changing, <laughs> it got sort of hard. Uh, so I've, I've mostly enjoyed the last two years teaching the small classes where you really get to interact with the students. You mentioned Oak Ridge uh, Lab, and that Hollander was a real character. Yeah. There was another character there named Waldo Cohn. Did you come across Waldo? Oh, Cohen? yes. Uh, <laughs> everybody there was a real character. <laughs> yeah, so what, what Waldo story do you have? Waldo's story is, you know, I think he is thought to have, you know, be the, been the guy who, you know, he worked on the Manhattan Project. He was part yeah. of the Manhattan Project. I think. He's supposed to be the guy who used, who used the experience from the Manhattan Project to develop these ion exchange resins. Uh -huh. uh, that allowed you to separate individual nucleotides from one another. That was supposed to have been really important for RNA structure analysis later on. Uh -huh. And so he never forgot that, I think. But he, the character, Walter Kwan as a character is, I think he used to harass or hound everybody about nomenclature of uh, nuclei. Yeah. He tried, he tried to set up a whole system from the nomenclature of enzymes. Yeah. He would harass people with meaning and literature. Do you that? Yeah. I don't know if that nomenclature is ever stuck or not. <laughs> I didn't know that part of it. I interacted a lot more with the geneticists than with the biochemists. They uh -huh. also used to have a meeting, uh, host a meeting in Gatlinburg. I went to a couple of those meetings. Yeah. It was just beautiful meetings. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, lovely, yeah. lovely you know, yeah. uh, place yeah. to have a meeting in the Smoky Mountains. Uh -huh. and that was something else that Hollander started. Uh, they also had meetings in South America very frequently. And Oak, Oak Ridge was a great source of radioactive isotopes that they would send out. That's right. Yeah. 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 And there were all sorts of radiation facilities and things. So if you wanted to do radiation biology, it was a super place to be. And it's a really lovely town in the middle of the mountains, much like Gatlinburg, with uh, lakes nearby and things. So. Settlers, settlers, were there? The settlers were there. Yeah, that's uh -huh. right, yeah, also. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. DNA repair, was he? Or, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Very big. Yeah. Very big. Yeah, uh, they, the place, Hollander's place really populated universities all over this country uh, with people. He mostly hired young people, kept them for a little while, and sent them off again. So, yeah. So I'm curious, um, you know, you said that you spent your life doing other things Look, you know, looking at, so saying, all right, well, women don't have positions here, so this is where I'll, you know, set my highest aspiration to where I see other women going. When you got offers to then start um, interviewing all over the country and then um, came, eventually came to MIT, did you feel pressure, um, extra pressure, um, the thought, you know, with your gender, knowing that you're a woman? And also being a professor, did you feel like you had to do anything extra special? Or um, did you just try to be the best scientist you were and just leave it at that? I think everybody at MIT tries to be the best scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's any, any way around that. Yeah. You, you like to climb mountains, is that correct? Yeah. Tell us about some of your uh, you know, uh, climbing experiences. Uh, the, the first one was, well, let's see, I've been in the Himalayas, the Japan Alps following Lisa's footsteps, uh, the 
Caracorums, uh, the Sierras. Uh, I, one of the lectures I was invited to in Israel, they said, we're sure you'll come because we'll promise you a hike in the mountains if you come. <laughs> <laughs> I agreed to run for president of the Genetic Society because I could get to India for the international meeting and that Anna Maria and I and some people organized a trek in, around Annapurna that year uh, on the way back from the meeting. Don't forget the Blue Hills. Oh yes, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa and I have done the Blue Hills and Stand the Nanak, Stone to Stern and the Wallpack Trail from one end to another in one day, a, a very hot day, picked because it was the longest day, not thinking it was going to be the hottest. <laughs> but we made it. Yes? Since you've been here, what are the changes you've seen in the biology department from when you came and what's happened through the years? Or the most well, interesting there, changes? There were something like 35 people in the department in 72, is that right, Gene? Uh, about that, I guess. <clears throat> there were 14, I was the 14th faculty member when I arrived here. Yeah, I think there so, were 38 back in 77, <laughs> so. Now, so, yeah. is that expanded because of the cancer center? Uh, the cancer center was yeah. just starting up in 72. That, that allowed us to add another dozen or so faculty members, yeah. which was really very nice at that time. Yeah. Uh, and, and then when the White Hat was formed, we allowed us to expand even more. Uh, so those, those two things allowed us to expand greatly in number of faculty. Uh -huh. And the student body, the undergraduate student body has changed because when I got here, there was something like 10% of the undergrads were female. And totally, I'm not sure in this department. More than 50%. Uh, more than 50% yeah. in the whole, the whole school, not just this department. Uh, in the department, it's about 60 65% female yeah. biology majors. So it didn't, I don't think there's been much change in the percent of graduate <clears throat> students. There have always been quite a number of female graduate students. But that's been true for years, even before that. When I was a graduate student, we were about 30% of the class then. Yeah? You also mentioned when you were you know, in grad school, you had to do everything yourself. So there were no kids and So And now, you know, it's, science has changed tremendously. So do you think the training is the same? I kind of worry about people not knowing exactly what comes in when you put the sample in here and you get the other out the end. Uh, I kind of worry about people not knowing exactly what's happened. I find that's a little bit distressing. On the other hand, it sure makes things simpler if you know that every buffer is the right pH and things like that. So uh, it allows you to do a lot of things, a lot more different things because you don't have to spend as much time troubleshooting the experiments. So you win some, you lose some. Yeah. You win some and you lose some. But what about uh, the youngsters who never do anything without a kid? Well, there too. They, they win some, lose some. <laughs> <laughs> At least at least some things work pretty soon on, which is pleasant. Yeah. I wanted to know um, two things. What's your greatest joy about being involved in scientific research? And then um, secondly, what like, piece of advice would you give to um, a young and upcoming scientists? Can you repeat the questions? Okay, so the first one is, what was my greatest joy with being a scientist? Mm -hmm. The thing is, what would be um, a piece of advice that you would give to a young and upcoming scientist? Oh, the greatest joy is when an experiment you didn't think would work works. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the advice, I think, I keep going back to something that I learned from Salva. When I ran, ran into Salva once when he was talking to a very conservative guy, 
And Salva was betting with this conservative guy that the conservative candidate was going to win in the next election. And I said, after the other went off, I said, Salva, you are betting on the conservative candidate? And he said, I look at it this way. If the conservative candidate wins, I win the bet. If he loses, I win the election. <laughs> I thought, this is a guy who got his Nobel Prize for understanding probability. <laughs> so yeah, what I would say is I've always found that it, it's worth going with the things you really like, because then you get the thing you really like, at least. You've done a lot of service <coughs> stuff from serving on council to doing stuff around here that's gone beyond academics and teaching. I wonder if there are any things you've done in that arena that stand out in your mind that you had a special impact and meant something, something special to you. Uh, I, I think that the women's committee that Nancy Hopkins ran was probably the most clear-cut impact that I have seen around here. That was a lot of time and effort. She put a lot of leadership into that, but I think it's made a difference. So what did that entail? Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was putting together some actual data about whether women were getting the fair share of what they were looking for. So the, there were, what, 16 tenured women in the School of Science. And of that, 15 of us got together and talked to Virginia about putting together a committee that could actually get some data. I think that much of the difference was because women didn't ask and didn't know what to ask for. Uh, so I, I don't think it was nearly so much intentional prejudice, but there certainly was some data which made things very easy, and it made some differences. Well, Mary Lou, I can, I can tell you that I was very pleased when you decided to come here as a faculty. <laughs> I was very pleased. Thank you. I've I was associate head of the department at that time. I've been pleased too. You're at a good department. 